Um, everybody, this is uh, Rich Benjamin, um, head coach at Indiana Wesleyan University. Um, he was gracious enough to kind of uh, let me kind of learn from him and do some stuff back in 2014 when he was at Judson. Uh, really great experience for me. Um, somebody I've learned a ton from, great mentor. Uh, and so I just kind of wanted to have him on here to talk about um, – your presentation is called the, the Box versus the Line, right? Yes, sir, yeah. Yeah, so um, I'll let you kind of go into that, and uh, we'll kind of kick it off with that, and I'll, uh, I'll get my dog to stop barking. Awesome. <laughs> Great. Hey, well, thanks for having me, Ryan, and uh, thanks for the rest of you guys for um, opening up a few minutes here to kind of dive into this topic. Uh, I know that um, I probably have 30 minutes worth of information. I have 15 minutes to share it, and so whatever we don't get to, if there's something of interest that you want to dive into uh, individually, uh, just shoot me an email um, at Indiana Wesleyan, and we'll set up a time. Uh, obviously, with our season getting canceled, we have plenty of time to to kind of connect and network and keep growing. So uh, I would welcome that if anybody wanted to take advantage of that. So, well, the premise of the, the box versus the line uh, really comes from my experience with perfectionism. And, um, you know, I think a lot of coaches have this in common where, we're very driven. Uh, if we weren't driven, we probably wouldn't be very good at what we do. Um, but, uh, and there's also, you know, everything that we do is measured, right? And so when everything is measured and there's a high work ethic present, um, there's a chance that perfectionism can start to consume or paralyze the room, right? And so um, I think you can experience that at moments as a leader. Um, I think on your teams, uh, the players you coach, um, if I said, hey, do you have players that struggle with perfectionism? There's, there's no doubt that there would be a relatively high number uh, of student athletes and stuff that you guys have worked with where you're like, their biggest challenge is their ability to move on, right? Their ability to um, just know that like, we can build from this moment, we can let go of the previous moment. Um, and then from like more of a culture team aspect, how this topic is going to tie in is from a culture team perspective, you know, we all know the teammates that we've had who are very inclusive, who include other people, they welcome them in, uh, they challenge them to grow in an effective and healthy way. Um, and we know that we've had teammates, right, who create not just clicks, but um, clicks that are very um, detrimental to other groups on the team, right? Where a person is defined by where they're at more than where they're going, right? And so I want to dive into this topic a little bit with you. Um, I'll kind of start off by saying, obviously, like you as an individual self uh, and your organization that you either work for or you, or you lead, um, all those organizations have a set of values, right? could be three to five, sometimes as many as 10 values, where basically as an individual in your personal life or in the organization, you say, hey, this is how we're going to define growth. These are the decisions. This is the, these are the values that we're going to make decisions through. Uh, we're going to be proactive and reactive through these values um, and so forth. And so the players that we lead, they're aware of these values too. If you have five values in your organization, your players are aware of it. And so, you know, one thing that we initially see is that uh, we kind of have a saying among the coaching staff that nobody shows you who they really are in the first two weeks, right? The first two weeks they're on campus, they're just showing you that they are a 10 out of 10 for, for the values of the organization, right? And so, they are showing that in that moment, but we're aware, right, that like that's not going to last. And so, um, you know, you could have a, a, a value like selflessness, right? You could say that's really important to be a great teammate. And you could say get through the fall, right? And you'd be like, man, we got some kids who are great teammates. Well, you haven't handed out any playing time yet, right? And now you hand out playing time in the spring and you start to see a shift or a struggle or a challenge with some guys with their roles. Um, and how to navigate that among themselves uh, and among their teammates, right? And so there's a value that might have looked like an 8 or a 9 or a 10 out of 10 for the first six months on campus. Now it's just shifted to a 4, 
right? And it happened after two weekends of sitting in February, right? What do we do with that, right? And so the way I look at it is um, you, you can look at your value system in the growth process as two ways. Uh, one of them is you can look at it as a box, right? And inside that box, let's say that's your five values. Let's say we use work ethic, selflessness, um, passion, joy, um, and honesty, right? Let's say those are our five values, right? And, you know, what can happen is you can have a situation where um, a person comes into the room, they're aware of the values, and it's basically, okay, I have to look like I'm in this box 24-7. Right. I have to look like I have to look the part in front of my coaches and my teammates from three to six PM each day. I have to be looking I have to look like I'm in this box. I'm ten out of ten in all the values. I can't show my real cards because I'm either in the box or I'm out of the box. Right. So transparency is a huge challenge, a huge issue, right? And so, you know, we see that as a challenge initially when kids come into an environment and they feel like, Hey, I really can't show my true cards right here. I can't show what I'm struggling with uh, and so forth. And so when that happens, you know, obviously the opportunities for growth are very, very limited. And so the other way to look at how do we grow within, you know, the values of an organization is to look at a line. And if this line starts down here at the bottom with a zero, and then it kind of goes up and down and then finishes up here at a 10, right? And trying to create an atmosphere in which somebody can come and say, hey, look, selflessness, I'm a five right now on that line, you know? And like, here are all the reasons why. And know that the pushback they're gonna get is not gonna be one that says, well, hey, you know what? You're out of the box now, you're gone, right? Instead, the pushback is, getting to the heart of the issue of why it's a five and then challenging that person with how can it go ahead and improve from a five towards a 10, right? So it's this open-ended journey that's being experienced and the player or you as an individual person, if you apply this to your personal life, you feel like you have the freedom to be transparent because you know that yes, you're gonna be heard and you're gonna be challenged to grow from that place. It's not a, a yes or a no or either or an or, if that makes sense. So we look at a few different ways once this is implemented. Um, one being that, you know, growth um, and the way values are, are handled inside of an organization look um, very different uh, for people. So it's like, you know, how does this happen? Well, if it's in the box, then we consider like at that point, the individual's hiding right? They're hiding their true self so they can look the part and that the opportunity for growth is not going to be present. Um, the other challenge, right, is if a person reveals the reality of where they're at, um, that they're going to be casted out, right? So then there's no opportunity for growth. So that person is also doesn't benefit from the transparency. Um, you can have another option where somebody reveals the reality of where they're at but the person next to them says, hey, it's okay. And you can just stay in this place, right? Like you don't have to grow. You can just be you in the version that you are right now forever, right? And we don't see growth in that place as well. Um, we can see somebody reveal the reality of themselves and then somebody try to force change upon that person where it's more like me against you. We think the healthiest form is when you reveal the reality about yourself and what's going on in that moment. And it's met with this reality of you're heard, you know, this is reality right now. Um, however, we're not going to leave you here. And so it's not me against you or me in the value system against you. It's me with you growing towards the value system. And so trying to create that with atmosphere where this person feels like I don't have to stay on an island. I don't have to stay hidden. I can reveal the reality of what's going on in my life in this situation. And it's going to be met by not just being heard and accepted, 
but then challenge towards growth, right? And so something I share with our assistant coaches and our players is like, we don't need you to be perfect, uh, but we need you to commit to grow, right? And so if they can see that on the line, they know this is open-ended growth um, and this is something that can be welcomed and changed over time. Um, but if they come in and it's like, hey, these are our values, catch the vision or catch the bus uh, right out of the gate, the opportunity to get, to get real transparency from those people that you're leading and you're working with and aside uh, is going to be incredibly difficult. And so I think there gets to a point in an organization where you have to have the right people on the bus and somebody may have to be removed. Um, but, at that, but that's after making opportunities and attempts to, for that person to have opportunities to grow and develop from where they're at. And so I, I think some examples of it would be like, you know, this year, you know, we had a student athlete and, um, you know, he had a couple challenges, uh, talented player, but he had a couple challenges. And um, when he finally got to the place two months into his experience where he could become transparent with us, he got to see our response to his transparency. And the response wasn't, well, hey, if you're not in the box, then you're out of the box. The response to his transparency was, hey, yeah, we hear you. Like, this is a challenge and this is broken in this area. Man, how can we partner with you to help you move from this place forward, right? That this isn't fatal. It's not final. This is just a moment in your story. How can we walk with you to accomplish this? And so what we have found is that we don't have to sweep someone's reality under the rug and just ignore it. Um, and we don't have to dismiss somebody right out of the gate as well. Um, but that in all things, we can promote growth uh, and, and a sense of, um, you know, a sense of unity and a, and a sense of, um, you know, of transparency that I think is essential if you're going to do life with somebody uh, for any extended period of time. So that's kind of the foundation of the box versus the line. Um, Ryan, if you want to open up to any questions or whatever direction you want to go into. Um. Yeah, definitely. I definitely, if you guys have questions, um, just like normal, let's just unmute ourselves instead of typing them in the chat, just so it's a little bit more efficient. Um, and if we have like three people talking, we'll just uh, go from there. Um, one thing I think is there are definitely some players on here too that maybe aren't coaches. I think you can take a lot of what we talked about previous to this and understand that if there's somebody next to you who is going through some of that stuff or has challenges, like knowing what your challenges are and what their challenges are, you guys can work together to kind of grow on that line as well. It's not something that just has to be player coach. Um, and Rich, and like in our case too, you know, back in 2014, like that was something you did for me as a coach. Like there was a lot of times where, you know, you definitely were like, Hey, like this is real. This is what's going on. Like this is kind of where you have to go. And it wasn't described that way, but it definitely something was something where I felt like, I could give you my true opinion on certain things or do whatever. And you would, you know, respond with, you know, really good questions and kind of get me thinking and then also kind of guide me, you know, towards that. And I think, you know, a lot of times, you know, for me as in, in a business, we have to do that with our staff as well and kind of make sure that we know that like to work here, you don't have to be perfect to play here. You don't have to be perfect. You know, so that we're just trying to push, push on these lines and here are your strengths and here's some things we think you can improve on. Um, and then knowing that us as leaders, like we always have things to improve on and we always have like growth areas to, um, to dive into um, on that side of things. So if you're a player listening, I think that that's, that's really key to kind of make sure you're bringing your players up as well. Don't feel like this has to just be a, a coach player, um, you know, atmosphere type thing. So with that being said, uh, I don't know if, does anybody have any questions? Um, any specific yeah, questions? Yeah, coach, I got a question. Mm -hmm. um, what do you mean when you say don't be perfect, but commit to growth? Yeah. So, you know, I think the reality is like, I mean, I'm a person of faith. Right. And so like, man, like Christ redeems me and, and he gives, he makes me righteous in him. Right. But like the living out of that life, the living out of that truth and that reality in every area of life, including baseball, right. Is this reality that like, you know, it's not perfect. It's rarely if ever perfect. And it certainly isn't perfect all the time. Right. And so I think that getting to a place where you can be honest with yourself because you're not going to be condemned, you're just going to respond to conviction. Right. To be honest with yourself and say, hey, you know what? Like in this area right now, 
this is not a 10 out of 10. And like, that's okay. It's a five, you know, it's a five, but you know what? Like there's some variables here and there's some partnerships and so forth that, that I can dive into and really get some understanding about why this thing's a five and how it can become a seven. Right. And it's just a journey. Right. And so, you know, it's something like my wife talked about how, you know, like if, if you want to get better at kindness, you have to practice kindness. Right. You can't just assume that, like, if you're not naturally a 10 out of 10 at kindness, well, then kindness just isn't for you. Right. You're just never going to be kind. Like, it, life doesn't work that way. Right. And so, what you have to do is intentionally practice kindness. And you might go two weeks where, like, you're intentionally more kind. And then two weeks later, you may fall into the spirit of stupid. All right. And do something really, really uncomfortable. Right. And then what are you going to do? Are you going to just say, well, then I guess I'm not kind because after two weeks I had this moment of failure. Or are you going to say like, it's my privilege to practice kindness. It's my privilege to have a moment of failure and get to go practice kindness again. Right. Until it becomes me. Right. And, and so forth. And so, you know, I, I think that's kind of how I look at that piece is like, you know, you have to be honest with reality, but then realize that reality, it's not forever and it's not in that moment. It can grow from there, but it can only grow from there if you're willing to be honest and not condemn yourself and say things like, well, this is just, this is just who I am, right? I think that's the biggest lie that we tell ourselves uh, that's so hindering to, to our growth. Thank good you. Question. Good question, Ty. Anybody else have any, any questions? Hey, quickly, Ryan, I, I think on like, from a player perspective, right, on a team, um, how often on teams do you hear players say, well, there's clicks, right? Well, yeah. if there's 30 people in the room, there's going to be four or five friend groups, right? Yeah. And what I've realized is the issue is not that there's four or five friend groups. The issue is if one or more of those friend groups can't love people where they're at and challenge them to grow at the same time. If one of those friend groups on a team outcast another friend group or shuns them, then you have silos, right? Then you have real clicks, but there's never going to be a friend group that has 30 people in it, right? You're going to have friend groups of three to five people, sometimes six, but the issue is when does that become a fraction, right? It's when one group says, hey, man, you either have to be like, you have to have it all together right now or you're out, right? And so I think it's like, if you can get the people inside those groups to say, hey, you don't have to pretend to be perfect, but you have to commit to growing. You have to commit to being real, right? Then the conversations among players after moments of failure and even during moments of success are, can be incredibly healthy. No, it's a great point. Great point. It's awesome. Um, Awesome, Rich. Hey, I really appreciate you coming on and donating your time and talking about this stuff. Um, like you said, if, uh, if you guys have any questions, he's more than willing to, to talk more about this or, or dive in deeper. Um, you know, he kind of squeezed all this into 15 minutes um, and we'll kind of go from there. So uh, thanks, man. I really appreciate your time. Absolutely. Thanks, man. Yep. Uh, Jordan, um, you're up. See, so you're on here. You're an awesome facility. Hey guys, what's up? How are we doing? Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, it's a glorif it's, it's not really a facility. This is a, this is a garage that I tricked out into, <laughs> into a, a lab. So, um, uh, not to be cliche, but yeah, I like <laughs> to call it heating lab. Uh, Rich, that was awesome, man. Thank you very much for that. That's, I mean, I'm, I'm here for the same reason that everybody else is. I want to, I want to be involved. I want to learn from everybody I can. And uh, something that gets me fired up is when a young person goes in front of a college guy and, and like asks a question like that. It's really cool. So um, I wish I had one. I wish I had the opportunity to do stuff like this when I was a young person, but also have the confidence to ask a question in front of other people and to search out how to get better. I don't think I was good enough at that. Um, so very cool. Um, I, I love working with young people. I, I mean, Pro guys are awesome. Um, they, they, they are because they make everything look good, right? But uh, seeing young people 
take a route in their life that is different because you were a, you are a piece of that is, is probably the most rewarding thing we can do as coaches, or at least that I feel I can do as a coach. So in case you guys don't know me, I'm a minor league hitting coach with the Cincinnati Reds. Um, I'm also the owner of rounding third baseball performance in Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, I wanted to bring up some, uh, adjustability at home today. I feel like there's going to be some pieces that you can't quite replicate because ultimately the, the best thing we can do as hitters is face live pitching. I mean, it's not, I mean, that's, there's nothing flashy about that, but that is the single best thing in my mind we can do is face tough pitching and try to get better and try to make adjustments from swing to swing or from at, from pitch to pitch and at bat to at bat. So I think the thing that we lose at home or that's that we're going to lose at home during this quarantine is tempo, timing, rhythm, decision-making, pitch tunneling, vision, the things that we're starting to do and get into in the spring, all of a sudden get pulled out from under us. So I want to make sure we're doing as much as we can at home or that I'm giving you some information I feel like can be helpful for you to maintain ultimately the perception and action piece, right? We want to make sure we're perceiving information and learning how to turn it into action or make a decision. So I'm going to define adjustability real quick. Again, like Rich said, I only have 15 minutes uh, to pack in a lot of stuff. So I'm going to try to be as quick about it as possible. Um, I define adjustability as doing damage on as many possible pitch types, pitch locations, and pitch depths. So I feel like adjustable hitters can do damage uh, in a bigger hot zone. Um, and the guys who can't do a bigger hot zone have to be really good at not swinging outside their hot zone to survive ultimately uh, at the highest level. So I think that's really key for us. And if I'm a young person or high school age guy, or college age guy, or even up to pro level, I want to make sure that I don't lose that same feel when I, when I'm at home, when I have limited equipment, limited people, limited coaching to help me. So, um, so yeah, I'm going to go over, I'm going to try to share my screen here. See how this works. If I need to make you the host, I can real quick, but it looks like you got it. Can you see it? You guys okay? Yeah, we're good, man. Awesome. Okay, so I think number one thing that we're going to lose the feel of, uh, so I shouldn't say number one, but let's think about moves that are vital to adjustability, right? So I got to make sure that I'm in sync or doing the dance with the pitcher. And notice how Miguel, hopefully this is good enough for all you guys to see, but as – as a pitcher's working down the mound, he's kind of working back into his back hip or into his load one, right? So we're moving the load. If we think of hitting as there's two loads, right? We got to, we have to move to start or the simple repeatable timing mechanism, get ourselves going, get ourselves to be on time. And two, we got to load forward, right? So we got to make our initial move to get things going, get the train going and give ourselves a shot to get everything running. And we got to go forward. Um, so that's kind of what we want to, we want to make sure we have enough time. So if I can be as simple as possible about this, if we are rushed, we can't make good decisions, then we can't be adjustable. So something we can be working on at home right now is how to put a huge value on timing and when, to, and when to start on time. And if you have the ability to do front toss or side toss, be very cognizant of when you are starting, right? Because we don't want to fit a whole bunch of, you know, we don't want to fit loading, unloading, decision-making, and perception on this little tiny bundle. We want to have space to do all that. So timing is a huge piece of that. Next video I'll show you here. Let me see if I can move this out of the way. Here's Yelich. Watch when he starts his move. Now, now, now. So then he has a ton of time to make that stop. Now that's just a take. So that's another piece. That's more of a So the next phase we want to think about is where are we getting to at launch position? So if everybody's familiar with the term launch position, it's that point in which we uh, are landing the front foot. We haven't, we haven't made a commitment to the swing yet. We're still uncommitted. This is uh this is my like infomercial version of it. The one on the left is like, Holy moly, come on guy. Really? Um, but the, uh, the one on the right gives us more options. So if we think about how an infielder, lands his feet after the pitch is being thrown, that infielder can move in a number of different directions. And so the guy on the right is essentially that infielder that can choose which way he wants to go. The guy on the left 
he's kind of committed to one swing path there. We don't want to be committed. To, we don't want to be a one trick pony. We want to have options. So that's, that's a key piece right there. So this next one I'm going to show you, this is Baez. This is me recording my television in the world series right here. This is awesome. Definitely early shifting his weight into his front leg a little heavy. Thank you very much. Right. So it's really cool to, we can practice this at home is how to control the weight shift. And the weight shift is a huge piece of our adjustability here. We don't want to be getting out on the front leg on fastballs, but we definitely want to have the option to get into the front leg if we are on fastball timing and realize, oh crap, um, we need to hit this curveball right here because we've got a two strike count. So ultimately I want to make sure that we control this and show this next video here. So this is just, Still shot to Mike Trout, guy on the left, fastball, home run, guy on the right, off-speed, home run, sorry, changeup, home run. So you can just see the little bit of difference. He's really trying to hold that rear heel in the ground. Again, I'm not going to try to get too into mechanics. I just want to highlight a couple things about what moves make us adjustable and what kind of contribute to adjustability in our swing. You can definitely see a little more, little more center of mass or center of gravity forward there. So pretty cool. So the next thing that I feel like is really important, I'm just going to review real quick. The next thing I feel is, well, sorry, let me review real quick. So a couple moves to adjustability. You want to be on time, right? So handbrake or as the pitcher's working down the mound, that gives us enough time to make decisions. Uh, two, posture at launch, right? So good posture at launch makes us adjustable to multiple locations, pitch types, et cetera. And then the weight shift is what we just looked at. So now we're going to look at Miguel Cabrera here, this idea of turning the corner. If we turn deep, if we figure out how to turn the corner and enter the zone clean, do you think Miguel could stop there if he needed to? I think so. I think Miguel could do it. Obviously he does, right? But valuing the take and the ability to slam on the brakes is huge because that is going to make us adjustable. And Adjustable doesn't necessarily mean hitting every time. Adjustable means can I stop? And that's the that's key piece right there. So that's the idea of turning the corner. So it allows us deep entry with good direction, allows us to slam on the brakes. And lastly, it gives us that wiggle room. We don't have to be so perfect, right? If we have good direction, we don't have to be so perfect. So here's Miguel. This is a pretty cool image. Not my own, stole it from somebody else. Thankful for Twitter. Um, this is just nuts, right? Doing damage on all sections of the zone. Pretty crazy. So, oh, I was listening to some Patty Griffin there. That's cool. Um, so here's a softball player. I know there's some, some softball players or coaches on here. Um, I just want to show you the difference between – this is a Missouri commit right here I've worked with. You can see on the left how, like, barred out she is. I just want you to notice the difference in which one's committed and which one's not committed. You can definitely see kind of through the middle how much more adjustable she is compared to day one. So that's kind of what you can, I mean, that's four weeks right there. I mean, we've been in quarantine for that long. So it's not, it's not impossible to, to clean yourself up a little bit. And I'm not going to show this video just yet. So I'm going to go back into Zoom here. Sorry, guys. Um, so uh, am I off screen share? Uh, no, it says you're still sharing. You, um, I can take it off, though. Oh, there we go. I got it. All right. Cool. Um, sorry, I haven't done that a whole lot. Um, so those are some really big pieces. I'm just checking my time here. Again, I want to not go over, but um, those are our key moves for adjustability. And the things we can kind of start to compile at home are, okay, how do I divide this into drill work or how do I, how do I keep – some of these same ideals in play at home. So I'm going to go over a couple of them and then I'll screen share again and show you some of these drills. But I want to make sure number one, that I know distances relative to the plate. So if I, if I need to replicate a fastball and all I have is 20 feet of space and my dad or my brother or my sister to help me throw, I want to make sure I know how much time I need to have. So I'll share my screen again here. Click 
to the end. So these are my drills I'm about to show you guys and just some different stuff. So um, I apologize for this being a screenshot right here, but driveline put out a really good image on just simulating, simulating game speed reaction time. So if you don't have this image, I'm pretty sure it's available on their, um, on their Twitter account, but you can just see like front toss, like if I only have 15 feet, I need to throw at 26 miles an hour um, to, to get that same reaction time. Uh, to get 95 mile an hour reaction time. So again, it's not the same, but at least you are training again, perception and action. How much time do I have to respond? Am I replicating the same amount of time I would have to make a decision? So that's, I feel like a really huge piece. If that is the only thing you do, you are still at least keeping yourself timed for fastball, which fastball I believe is what we survive and live on. And if we're good hitters, we know how to hit it. We know how to be precise with hitting those. So I'm going to go into a couple of drills here that I feel might be really valuable. And again, I'm going to go quick. So just holler at me at the end if you have questions. I'm going to show you one guy here. This is a really good example. So here, here's where valuing the take, right? So the guy on the bottom takes, right? takes in a great position. You can see he's really fighting hard to hold that launch position. He's got really good posture right there. I don't think the guy on top who hits the homer happens if this guy on bottom doesn't take that pitch, for example, right? So if I'm in a 2-2 count, the guy on top right here, this is a 3-2 count he's hitting this homer in. He absolutely smashes it. This guy on the bottom, this is a 2-2 count. Now, obviously, this is not the same game. So I'm just building a storyline here. But he doesn't get to this count without this take a lot of times, right? So it's interesting, like you put yourself in a totally different position if you take, and that is part of that being adjustable. And I think he can slam on the brakes here because he, he's in such a good position. And that allows him to work through that same position on the home run. So it's pretty cool. So let's go back to, so this is the probably the number one thing I think, oh, let's go back to this one. This is probably the number one thing I feel like we could easily implement if you have two people, if you have somebody to help you with, with soft toss. So all I'm doing to this guy, I'm just pump faking him. So what did that do? It got him out on his front foot. It got him to feel like, can he control that position? Super simple, but he's, you're now simulating an off-speed pitch. You're now simulating something uh, that is not very predictable, which I like. And you're doing it in a super controlled setting, right? So I think that's a huge easy piece let's let's look at another front toss thing we can do here there's another college guy right here hard in soft away and i'm just trying to like go quick and then i'm like <laughs> he screwed that up right there he's laughing at himself try to go kind of back in and quick makes a better move there good so not great so the cool thing is that's a video of him kind of struggling through that and you can see where that he needs to be in some better positions. He's kind of committing forward. He's, he's almost cheating. And then this one's kind of a classic right here. This is Larkin drill. So when I don't throw the ball, he's got to hit that ball off the tee. He's probably got that tee a little too high. In a perfect world, I want him to have that a little lower. That way it provides a little bigger difference between what I'd normally throw. I want to give his brain some reference points there about how he can move in space. So we'll go here to this next one. Okay, so that's what I have here. I'm going to sneak back to this other drill. I'm going to fast forward on this one. This one's called 012. So remember we talked about that weight shift? This is actually a video I gave to some of the Reds guys because I'm trying to help them with some ideas that they can be doing at home. So again, this is zero one two drill. So I'm going to do a, a zero count, a one 1,000 count, and a two 1,000 count to practice how my weight is shifting and if I can control my weight shift because I don't want to, I don't want to do a momentum shift forward. I want to, I want to keep my middle in the middle and understand how I use my legs to 
still be in a good launch position to fire from. That's me just fastball timing. That was not a great swing. You can see I had a little added movement there, pretty late hitch. But what I am trying to do, you will screw this drill up. What I am trying to do is find myself in a better position. So what I should do right there is redo that and figure out, okay, what, why didn't I, control my weight shift very well there. So I start the clock when my foot goes down. I think that's the idea is we wanna be adjustable through that front foot and continue to load through that front foot so that we have, we have options. So I think, uh, so let me, let me stop the share here. So those are a couple of drills I feel like can be really helpful that don't take a lot. Um, the other one I want to share is I'm going to kind of show you, I'm going to kind of tilt this this way. And I'm filming videos in here. So this is a little goofy right now. I got things all over the place. So I got a TV over here. I don't know if you can see that TV over there. So what I can do on that TV is I can connect to YouTube and throw up a picture. I can throw up a picture back here and I can, and actually work on my timing as I'm watching the TV. So if I pull up a catcher view of a pitcher, I can see I can see everything he's doing. I can I can kind of feel when I want to when I want to move the load and when I want to load forward, and I can just use my T just so I can actually hit a ball. So now I'm perception action perception action. And the great thing, you know, right now I feel like a lot of guys probably are not super conscious of their head posture off the tee, and they're probably doing the tee 80% of their time right now, which is, you know, not ideal, but it's, it's what you have to do. So we can get good head posture. Again, we can feel rhythm and tempo, bam, and then we can hit. I feel like the tee is normally a rhythm and tempo killer, and as long as you're cognizant of being a game-ready hitter in a, in a an adjustable game like hitter um, you can you can do a good job being creative that way so everyone has cell phones I would I don't know if using a cell phone is ideal there but at least maybe connecting into a TV everybody's got a TV somewhere um, uh, even a even a computer might work just to give you that visual because when we're spending six eight weeks I mean our body starts to our nervous system starts to lose stuff in about three to five weeks. So that if you've already gotten out of game mode completely and haven't done anything, you're kind of on the, you're kind of on the mend. You're on restart mode. You're, you're having to get that feel back of timing and all that stuff you were doing in the off season where you had people around you who could help you and environments where you could uh, see different pitch types and pitch locations. So just as a review, pump fakes. So pump fakes. Uh, zero one twos, which is the weight shift drill. Um, one I didn't go over, which is command drill. I didn't put the video in there, but that's essentially where you put up two T's, one on the outside half, one on the inside half. You get to launch position. So you're holding launch and someone calls out in or out. And like a drag racer, you got to go to the out. You got to go to the in. So, and since you have two T's up, you got to make a decision. You kind of have to, you got to anticipate which one I might go to and then make the quickest decision, quickest decision possible. So if you have two people, that's ideal. That, that person doesn't even have to do anything. Like my dad, he doesn't really like throwing to me because it hurts his arm and scares the crap out of him to be in here in the cage. So that's a perfect option for him. He can, he can just yell at me and say, in, out, go. Um, so same thing. If you have, if you have a non-skilled BP thrower, you can still use them for something. Um, so that, that could be helpful too. Hard in, soft away. So that's one of the drills we did. And again, that just takes a decent tosser. Uh, the Larkin drill, T tosser. Uh, chaos drill, which is like a, a Doug Latta, Craig Wallenbrock special, which is um, you actually have your eyes closed before you start. 
So eyes are closed. Tosser says go, and then he's either throwing it in the air or he he's waiting to throw it. So you got to control your timing mechanism, control your load forward. Chaos drill is really really easy. Um, another one I didn't post, which is red light, green light. So decision making. All the tosser has to do, and he can just go side toss, is call out a color or a number while the ball's in the air. So my favorite is to take um, warm colors and cold colors. So you have red, yellow, orange, green, blue, purple. Hot colors are a yes or a no. Cold colors are a yes or a no. And an at, the athlete is processing information like, oh, uh, that's a cold color, right? So then there's a little, there's a little more chaos going on up top, which is good because we need to learn how to eliminate noise, right? We need to be clear minded and simple minded and hitting is very complex. And, and the more we can start to eliminate noise and, and be clean up top and make better and quicker decisions, uh, the better off we're going to be. And so that's called red light, green light. You can do that with anything. I, I, you can yell Spanish, which, which is awesome. So odd numbers in Spanish or even numbers in Spanish. That one's really cool. It gets, gets guys singing like, Everybody knows Spanish one through ten. Hopefully, um, maybe maybe not since we're out of school right now and forgot Spanish. Uh, YouTube pitcher catcher behind the net, uh, and then lastly, what I want to say is keep score right now. Gosh, the the thing that we all strive for is to be competitive. Like we 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 love to be competitive. We want to be better than the next guy. We want to win, I and mean, ultimately, that's that's what we want to do. That's why it's that's that's what's motivating for us. So keeping score. Find some friends you can get on Zoom with. Find some people you can be involved with and be like, uh, you know, find, like Fungo Golf. So I got, I got a foot of snow outside, but if you're in a place where you can afford some Fungo Golf, do a, do a FaceTime Fungo Golf round and get outside and, and do stuff like that. Plus, if you can't hit a Fungo, like, th that's a problem. We have a, we have a hitting athleticism problem if you can't toss a ball to yourself and hit it and, and hit it where you want to go. So. That's all I have for you guys. Hopefully that's helpful. And I know I tried to pack a lot of information in there. So, um, yeah, if you have any questions. I had a question real quick. Shoot, my man. Um, do you have any drills for, like, heavy baseballs? Like, uh, for heavy baseballs? For, yeah. Uh, what, what kind do you have? We, uh, I just ordered those, like, um, green ones. They're, like, 16 ounces a pound or, like, or, no, like, 18 ounces. And they're, like, um, 2.9 inches in diameter. Yeah, okay. You can do a ton with those, dude. And, in fact, it, it might be even good to, to put them together with baseballs. That, that way you can kind of get the feel between, between the two. And they travel a little differently, right? A baseball might get thrown a little quicker, and the, and the heavier one's going to probably arc a little more. So you're actually kind of simulating a little different ball flight. Plus, you got to put a huge emphasis on how, how flush your contact is, right? And so feeling the difference between those two balls would be really helpful. I think the other thing you could use the weighted balls for would be that uh, pump fake drill, right? So just make that pump fake drill a little harder, right? you get to that position. Now you have a way to ball. Not only do you have to be in a good position to hit, you got to make sure you are precise. You hit the, you hit through that in the middle of that ball. Does that, does that sound good, Eli? Is that helpful enough? Yeah. I can also awesome. do the green light, red light with that, right? Actually, I that's that. what I do. That's, I mean, that is like primarily what I do that drill with because it's just you, the ball's almost, when you're doing it from soft toss, the ball's almost falling from like that, that angle. So you, you got to be precise. You got to be really clean and come in behind it. Thank you. Yeah, man. Anybody else have any other questions? That was awesome. Yeah, I got one. I got one, Coach. Um, when you're riding out to, like, read the pitch and it's off speed, are you riding out with your front foot up or do you just wait with your front foot down? That's a good question. You're, when your heel goes down, there's not a lot of time left for you to continue to ride that out. Does that make sense? So if you're a really good athlete, if you're a Mike Trout, if you're a, if you're a great mover and you're in your front heel, maybe you have a little more time to ride that thing out. 
But to answer your question, I feel like you're probably going to want to have that toe up and you want to buy yourself time toe to heel for as long as possible, because that's probably going to be the most attainable, easy way for somebody who is your age, like middle school to high school age, control and strength and, and, and overall uh, motor ability and, and coordination. I just, I just feel like that's probably your best bet. It's probably the biggest way you can do that. I think when you land in your heel, it, you're kind of triggering, right? I think you're getting like a signal to, to trigger at that point. So I would say forward with your, with your back leg, with your back hip, right? So whatever you're doing on your front side, we want to be pretty soft and pretty uncommitted until the last possible moment. So I would say, yeah, that, that toe, so heel in the air as long as possible. I wouldn't go, I wouldn't say, I don't know if you can see me right here. I'll show you real quick. I wouldn't say you'd want to go like that. You know what I mean? I think you'd probably want to be one, two. Does that make sense? Notice I'm still relying on my rear hip to make that move. I'm not going see the difference there heavy heavy if i'm in my front heel there too i'm that i only got i only got a little bit of time left before i really i do i gotta go forward right i gotta rotate so. good question ty sounds good thank you awesome anybody else uh, have anything jordan that was awesome thank you so much i really appreciate it um Love to uh, connect and uh, pick your brain and some stuff too. So um, let's make sure we uh, yeah, thanks for having me, do man. that later, later next, maybe early next week if you have time. Yeah, um, sounds good. Brett, we got Brett Thomas. You're up next, my man. Wait, how are we doing? Doing awesome. Hey, thanks again for doing this. Um, Brett and I first met when he was still working with Blast. Uh, and he's been a great resource for me, um, not only when he was with Blast, but uh, – you know, since he's been um, at Oregon as well, and uh, he's a really, really good hitting guy. Somebody I really like running past, uh, running things past, and doing stuff. So he's been um, uh, generous enough to donate some time as well today, uh, and talk about uh, two strike. Um, got a got a two strike approach here, to talking about two strikes in general. So Brad, I'm gonna turn it over to you if you kind of want to introduce yourself and um, run through that. Yeah, sweet. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for having me, um, start off, gosh, yeah, we met, gosh, in 2017, maybe 2018, um, when things were just getting started, uh, for you guys, and it's been great, uh, I'm over here at the University of Oregon now, I worked at a company called Blast Motion, uh, for the last three years, uh, I'm in charge of the player development and analytics portion. But uh, today what I really wanted to talk to you guys about was a two-strike approach. And two-strike approach from a hitter's perspective and from maybe even a team perspective. Uh, simple things that we can kind of go about and where we see a lot of success, whether that be in the college ranks um, or in the professional ranks and kind of can share, uh, share some stories there. But as we kind of get going, there's, there's two steps into a two strike approach. Uh, it can be physical, uh, like an adjustment in your swing, uh, whether that's a choke up, whether that's getting wider in the box, um, kind of just depends on what you're comfortable with as a hitter. And then there's a mental component to it. Uh, there's the positive aspect, positive talk. Uh, there's a team plan. So, um, what that team plan is one through nine, or when you're training, what that looks like for you. And then there's an individual plan. Uh, what are your goals outside of the team plan that gets you lined up no matter what the approach is? And what's interesting is when I was here playing at, at school at the University of Oregon, uh, ours was a mental plan. There wasn't much of a physical adjustment that was made um, throughout our lineup. It was, we're going to dominate the outside half. Uh, we're not, or the outside third. We're not going to strike out on the outside third. doesn't matter if it's a fastball. doesn't matter if it's a changeup. Um, we are going to battle and battle and battle 
until uh, we get something that's a little bit more hittable and then get up in the zone. Um, when I got to uh, play with the Seattle Mariners in their minor leagues for a little bit, it was a pure physical adjustment. They had every single player in the organization choke up with two strikes. Didn't matter who you were, didn't matter if you could hit 30 bombs or you hit two bombs. Uh, everybody needed to see a physical adjustment. That's what the coaches wanted. That's how it went from the top down. So that's what we did. So just like Votto did from there. So whatever you guys are comfortable with, players, if you want to make adjustments with your stances or anything like that, that's fantastic. That's something that you can practice. It's not always the sweet swing that you're just going to hit a bomb after bomb after bomb. I know that might not be what some coaches want, but there are going to be times where two strike stuff matters. And uh, the more we practice that, the easier it's going to be. So, and then from a coach standpoint, what are we going to do? Are we going to create a team plan? Uh, what's that team plan going to be? Uh, we're not going to strike out on fastballs. Um, there's a million different examples. And if you guys want to uh, save some, uh, save some time at the end to ask, then, then you can go ahead. But uh, what is, how is measured? This is more for the coaches side. This is something that we created here at Oregon. Um, and it's a tally of not only their at bats, but me had how many hits hit by pitch have with two strikes. How many pitches did they see? And then unfortunately, sometimes we strike out. What did those strikeouts look like? So just a way to to kind of track yourself and do all that. And we love to highlight guys who saw a lot of pitches with two strikes. You don't matter the result. Didn't matter. We uh, because we it was really important, especially on the beginning of a tournament, the beginning of a weekend. Uh, if we saw a lot of pitches, then that means that starting pitcher would go out and we would get to see their bullpen. And uh, that's when we would really be able to do some damage as well. So that's kind of just a brief overview of what that looked like for us. Um, great. Now, what does success look like? Uh, this is an example of some things, whether that be a physical adjustment or a lot of pitches in the at bat. This is a lot of numbers and things like that, that if you guys want to talk about, we can. But success is striking out a little bit less, seeing more pitches, more hits, hit by pitches and walks. And then the best way to be a two strike hitter is to not get to two strikes. So let's hit the pitch early, let's do some damage early so then we don't have to get to two strikes and make all of these adjustments. I know I just talked about for the last couple of minutes about the adjustments that we should make, but we don't have to get there if we don't want to. So stuff like Juan Soto, who really, really extends himself. Same with Harper. He kind of gets down and does a little bit more of a pelvic rotation. And uh, again, getting to those 10, 15 pitch at bats, five, 10 pitch at bats, even if you don't get a hit or a positive outcome, that helps the guy behind you. And helping that guy behind you, uh, whether that be seeing a pitch over the middle of the plate and him, him or her hitting the ball really well. Um, no matter what the scenario is. So what we do is, again, if somebody has a long at bat and eventually gets out and the next guy comes up and hits a double, we give, uh, we give love to the guys who weren't hitting or who just hit almost the same, if not more than the guy at second base, uh, because that's how much we, we value that and the toughness that you show every at bat, no matter if it's two strikes or not, is so, so, so important for it. So just kind of wanted to go over those few things uh, really quickly. And here's my contact information. If you have any questions or anything like that, my email, my phone number, and I know I talk really fast, so I wanted to throw a picture out there in case anybody's confused or have any questions for it. Um, please let me know. Awesome, Brett. Thank you. Um, I think one question that, that pops up a lot with two strikes, you talked about team plan versus individual plan. Um, how much do you how, – how do, how do coaches track um, – 
how do coaches track like which plan is going to work better for each guy when you talk about individual plans, especially if you're looking at like physical changes, do they like, do they get a big enough sample size to try something for a long enough time with two strikes to determine if they should make another two strike adjustment or if they should just kind of stick with that or if they should do, maybe, maybe there isn't as much of an adjustment. You talked about at the college level, there just being a mental adjustment. At what point do you say there needs to be a physical adjustment or not be a physical adjustment or is it just boil down to strategy? Yeah, that's a really good question, Ryan. For us, it's we we play or we scrimmage during the fall about three times a week. And on average, we'd have some guys get to two strikes, we'll call it three to four times uh, during that time frame or during that week. So we would spend two weeks on a specific two strike plan uh, physically. And some, it would click right away for, for some, and some others, it wouldn't necessarily click. So we start with the team plan, but then we modify after a couple of weeks. Um, see if the player has success, sweet, let's keep doing it. If not, this isn't, this isn't set in stone. None of these plans are set in stone. So then we start making adjustments and we ask our players, hey, are you comfortable getting really wide? Are you comfortable choking up? Uh, have you practiced it? Uh, no, coach, I haven't. Okay, then next practice, we're going to implement that to see if the reps are going to help or if it's just not in the cards for them. So it's really a player by player basis, but we base it off of two weeks of kind of trial. And then, then we kind of go from there. Awesome. Awesome. Do you ever recommend guys get into their two strike approach when they don't have two strikes in certain situations? Uh, yeah. <laughs> If you hit better with two with your two strike swing, sure, great. Uh, <laughs> we we have guys we had guys for example the past couple of years who were really good at slashing, and we would have them practice that slashing no matter what the count was or anything like that because that trains something else. So if you're really good at two strikes, you can use that as a tool to get you to kind of work backwards into your primary swing, is what we call it, but your primary swing. Um, do I suggest doing it all the time? Uh, maybe that just turns into your swing and you go from there. But uh, sometimes, no. Most of the time, no. We don't, we don't have that happen. Cool. I, I just kind of want to speak, too, on – you talked about, like, in a, at bats and giving credit to the guy who gets out and things like that. that. I mean, that happened for us a lot of times last year. One time in particular, um, ended up – it was late in the game, eighth inning. You know, guys tired. It was last game of the series – Second time, uh, second or third time, we had seen the guy, uh, the bullpen guy. Um, we had seen him a couple times, a couple series before. And our leadoff hitter, who's you know was really struggling at the time, who's went from about hitting 350 to 300, which doesn't sound like you're struggling, but when you drop 50 points that quickly, and we're already that deep in the season, I mean, he had he had, had a, a rough go, um, and he had maybe a 12, 15 pitch at bat. And that was what we made the whole thing about. We almost didn't even like, we almost didn't even praise the guy with the double. <laughs> we, yeah. uh, you know, from that aspect, like him battling and him getting there, I think it was a, you know, a guy hung a change up. He's out there like, you know, trying to like battle through and, you know, we know what's coming because we've seen him so many times and, and boom, it works. So um, absolutely guys. And I think that kind of goes into, we talked about like confidence in the past um, and some of these other, um, you know, belief, and you know how to pick yourself up when, when things aren't perfect and we talked about expected numbers sometimes or how to handle it when you have you know four hard hit balls but they don't fall um like what is your definition of success and like did you help your team in that moment is like what should like we should drive drive our confidence in that in that aspect yeah i mean in my opinion i'd, I'd listen to i'd listen to jordan and his mechanics and things like that and not not get to two strikes for sure uh don't miss your pitch if, if you can, but know that when you get to two strikes, the yeah, at-bats nowhere close to being over. And uh, being able to kind of understand that and then physically making adjustment or saying, hey, I'm always going to hit the ball. I hit the best balls over the shortstop's head, over the pitcher's head, uh, whatever it is. Then kind of getting in your getting in your mode of, of practicing that and doing that, it's going to help you with two strikes. Uh, Brett, I was going to mention uh, some of our pro data shows that we were in 48%. So we were in a two-strike count 48% of the time, roughly the last two years. So if if the data is anything close to college and high school baseball, 
you're going to spend a decent amount of your time. If you're not, if, if it's something you don't have a skill at, you're, you're going to need to develop that skill. You'd be logical to develop a good two strike approach or to start experimenting with, with something that might be a good physical or mental or both type uh, type adjustment with two strikes. Yeah, no doubt. That's great information. Great information. So it's awesome. Uh, Brian, hey, thanks a lot for having me, dude. And thanks a lot for having us. And uh, if anybody has any questions about any of this stuff, uh, again, my contact info is on here and just uh, hope everybody's doing well. Awesome. Thanks, Brad. I really appreciate your time, man. We'll, uh, we'll catch up soon. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> so real quick, guys, Jordan, do you have uh, maybe like one more minute? I just want to share my screen really quick. Um, I kind of want to get your take on yep. something. So sure. Ty, you asked the question about uh, kind of riding it out. And kind of the first thing is, is we see, we see two different things when we look at force plate data on that is when we see fastballs, we see the force plate data on the front foot basically just spike right away. Um, and what we see on the off speed pitches is there's a little bit of a hump and then it'll go up. And basically the longer that hump, the more adjustable that player is. Uh, depending on what they're doing. So, um, and something that, that, you know, we used to do is, you know, I actually stole this phrase from Rich, um, is if we're going to be wrong, be early, not late. Um, and so from that aspect, so this is kind of a, a video of a player who made an adjustment um, and he started so early that he was able to make this adjustment before his foot even got down. And because he does have a little bit more movement, which isn't going to be right for everybody um on this but as i just kind of play this he starts early on one but gets to the same spot at contact and both these balls were hit over 95 miles an hour so you'll notice he starts a little bit too early on the on the one and then what he does to kind of stop himself is he just kind of pauses puts his taps his foot down and then as he strides he's making almost the exact same move on right. both of them and both those balls were hit 95. i think one was like 97 and the other one was like 95 one if i recall right um, but kind of what's your what's your take on on starting and you know a, a topic that got brought up at, at spring training for us was does a bigger move sometimes leave more room for error in certain players versus a smaller move where we think it's going to be shorter more compact it's going to be simpler does that actually hinder their adjustability in a lot of cases yeah I mean it, it really depends I don't think that you know unless you experiment a little bit um, and and I don't think Number one, I think you have to isolate that that is the thing that it, that might be a route to help someone, right? So if, if if somebody has, you know, I'm trying to think of an example. If somebody is clearly, um, you know, never really gets to launch, you know, that I think that's a different story. I think if somebody has an inability to uh, – you know, or to say like they have super limited internal rotation of either the front or the back hip and they, they're not decelerating and not rotating super well because of it. Um, you, that, that's a different story. But I think if you're, you know, what you're talking about is if it's clear, clear that it's a timing issue and then there's, there's a faulty movement because of timing. If you don't experiment with leg kick, no stride, toe tap, holding longer, starting earlier, I don't, I don't think you ever, you'll never know. I also think it's dependent on body type, right? So if you have somebody who's a more rigid type mover, does the leg kick by him self, does, does it buy him some time and delay him so that he can just snap? Um, or, you know, does, you know, like Baez, for example, a ton of movement and probably needs to do more to get rid of slack in his tissue like he definitely obviously clearly needs that and clearly has a comfort zone with it um but i really unless you experiment with it i don't know how you would know if it's beneficial or not and what's the what's the risk like the first thought is do no harm right so if, if somebody's producing in games like why, why would you mess with the timing but if somebody's not producing and it's starting to become clear that it's a timing problem um 
what what steps can you take that are the least harmful and i think playing with the timing mechanism you're not affecting the swing you're you're affecting when they go and if somebody has a clear discomfort after a few days or a week trying a leg kick obviously you're going to bang it that's there's no point in continuing to ride that out i'm not saying if something's not comfortable the first day to not try it but i'm saying if 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 you're trying a leg kick and and you're starting to get some, you're starting to get a feel for it, and you're starting to realize like, oh, starting earlier might actually help. Um, and yeah, I think it can be can, can be hugely beneficial. I hope I'm a- answering that question right. Yeah, I, I don't think. I mean, obviously in that video they leg kick, but I think there's other ways to accomplish a, a bigger move. And I'm not saying you know being wild and crazy with it, because um, right. I, I agree with you. I think the type of I think the, the amount of mobility you have in your hips and through your thoracic spine and um, what's comfortable for you to do to get your swing off factors a lot from a mechanical perspective and a quote unquote, like, um, like a load concept or like the concept you use to create your load. Um, but just, you know, for a long time we've said, or baseball, the baseball industry has said like shorten up, shorten up, shorten up, shorten up um, from an adjustability standpoint. So I'm more, I wanted to kind of go back to, cause obviously your presentation was all about adjustability on what makes us, what provides some adjustability in the swing um, outside of, um, outside of, you know, some of the things you talked about, right? Cause obviously what you talked about and like, I, I, we can look at force plate data and like everything you talked about, like is very objective, um, you know, from, a, from what we believe like today, I think. Um, but just out going outside of that from, you know, looking in a mirror, playing with a loading mechanism or things like that outside of just a leg kick does potentially having some more movement in your swing in general, allow you to have more room for error. Um, cause you can adjust within that movement. And I'm thinking of a guy like, you know, um, you look at, look at like your Yerman Mercedes, right. And, um, you know, he's a guy who's in triple a for us. He was, you know, obviously in big league camp and he's got this big massive move and he doesn't get cheated ever. And it's one of those things where people are like, I just don't know how he does it, but he ends up being pretty adjustable with it as well. Um, but he's also a guy like Brett talked about with two strikes, like he will shorten up a little bit. Um, he'll, he'll take away that leg kick. He'll, um, you know, and he still is able to just absolutely hit some balls really hard, but I still feel like he's pretty adjustable even in, you know, before two strikes with that bigger move. And he's like a bigger kind of stockier guy too. If you guys, if you guys right. know who he is, he's somebody fun to watch, go watch some YouTube videos of. Yeah. I think it comes back to, so I always use the term simple, repeatable timing mechanism, right? So what is simple to you? It, you know, is a leg kick the most simplest way? Like, do you control that just fine? Uh, does a guy like Jose Bautista who implements a leg kick and it changes his career, um, you know, like – that became his simple way to do things. Um, I feel like Bryce Harper has simplified over time. I think he is, has less movement and less, he's less erratic. And so his version of, of simplifying and being more clean and more crisp is different than Bautista's was. And Bautista's looks like more movement. Um, Bryce Harper's looks like less movement. So really it's, it, I guess it's to figure out how, how do you isolate the next one percent or the next thing that is going to be helpful for you how do you how do you how do you how do you dig in and find that piece and i think it comes down to what what matters right an approach matters being on time matters making good decisions matters um you know movement matters obviously but you know the swing itself is is only one component of the of, of hitting I think having a having a really broad understanding of lots of different details allows you to pick from the buffet, but ultimately you only have one plate. You can fit all the food that you want onto, and you're only going to go to war with one plate full of food, right? So you can only really figure out. You can only have like three or four entrees on there before that plate's overloaded. You 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 don't want to overfill that overfill the bucket, if that makes sense. So I think if timing and the loading mechanism is the thing that makes you more adjustable or it's the, or it's the beginning of the dominoes that makes you more adjustable, then yeah, experiment and figure out what is simple. What is, yeah. What is simple? What is simple? What's repeatable and, and, and does it fit your body?
so I want to I want to just kind of highlight something that you said um, that I think is really cool. Um, one, keep it simple and keep it repeatable. But while keeping it repeatable, be willing to experiment. Right. So don't get locked into one thing just off the sake of just doing reps or trying to make it be identical. you got to be willing to experiment. And I think, too, with that experimentation, you're going to provide more adjustable movement solutions, even without thinking about it, too. Um, you know, in those times when you do have to just react and, and you're up there and you, all you all you are doing is focusing on your approach. Um, could you say the buffet thing one more time? I thought that was really, really cool. Um, I just don't want people to miss it. I thought that was, I thought that was really neat. how you said that there's this whole buffet of things and, you know, go out and let you do it. Yeah. I feel like the best hitters in the world and, and having been around a lot of different age groups of hitters, the ones that seem to do the best and, and ultimately continue to climb and, and maximize their potential are the ones that can take in a lot of different detail and take in a lot of different information and have an obsession and a hunger for hitting. But they understand that, that, there is there's their core there's the things that they know they want and know they do well taken away and ultimately gotta do what feels good what feels right but understand how to take in good and throw out what you cannot apply i could never hit with a leg kick it just didn't work well for me but I wanted to look like I wanted that look to my swing. I was sometimes so worried about like how my swing looked. I like wanted it to be super sweet. I wanted to look like a rod. It just wasn't going to be that way. I was always just going to kind of step and swing and it, it, it was fine. I probably maxed out my potential, but ultimately you have a buffet of information and you're going to see so many coaches. I had four different head coaches in college. You're going to have so many different, foods you can eat you're gonna have so many different options on the buffet but over time you're gonna to have to figure out I'm gonna put this on my plate this is what I'm gonna to go to war with right which which for me was like I'm never gonna hit a ground ball ever again because I'm slow and I need to I need to try to hit yams so I that was something on my plate that was huge for me it was a confidence booster and it gave me I'm trying to hit as many homers as I can I just that was what I want to do and it worked um, you, you have to you have to isolate what's going to be on your plate right so essentially the buffet analogy is be willing to hear keep your ears open find things that you can possibly utilize and start to and start to move things aside right go through that whole buffet and figure out what's good on there and that's what you're going to eat that's what you're going to go to war with and um because hit to me, hitting is as much being a, a knuckle dragging meathead as it is being a scholar. And you you have to you have, you have to fuse both of them. You can't just be completely dumb and go out and just bang. And you can't be a super cerebral and over evaluate and over analyze everything and expect it to work for you because that doesn't work either. You have to blend the simple with with the detail. And so having it having a good feel and that's why I love the buffet analogy so much is you're, you're essentially understanding how to learn and how to take in information and throw out what is not worthy of, of being on your plate. It's awesome, man. Thank you. I love that. Love that analogy. Anybody else uh, have any other questions or got anything else? Going once, going twice. Nobody. All right. Well, we'll uh, we'll call it there. If anybody wants to hang around, uh, coach wise, I know there's some compliance rules uh, for some of you guys who are on here. Um, we'll have the players jump off, and uh, we'll uh, go from there.